Hello, everybody, and welcome to this great session. We have a very exciting session ahead of us, and I have with me um, an excellent faculty. I have Dr. Francesco Giannini from Italy, Dr. Tommaso Gori from Germany, and Dr. Colin Berry from the UK. And today we are going to discuss actually about two very large group of patients, which until recently we said that these patients are no option patient. We didn't have treatment for these patients. And the things uh, uh, are changing currently. So we're going to talk about patients with refractory angina, either due to end stage diffuse severe obstructive coronary artery disease patient who have a refractory angina which is refractory to interventional and medical therapy uh, in which we exhausted all our way to help them with pci or by bypass uh, surgery and medication uh, and another very large group of patients who have persistent angina despite successful revascularization patient with non-obstructive coronary artery disease who still suffer from disabling angina. Uh, and until recently, we didn't know how to treat this group of patients, but now I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel and we will hear some very exciting data from uh, this fine group of researchers and clinicians that are with me in this session. So I would like to start with the first presentation and to show the classical uh, patient with refractory angina with obstructive coronary artery disease who really exhausted uh, most of our ability to help this patient. Uh, and we are going to talk about the reducer as a device-based therapy for patient with obstructive coronary artery disease, which suffers from severe angina and later on, we will move and uh, my friends will tell you about other kinds of patients with non-obstructive coronary artery disease who suffer uh, from the same problem, disabling angina. So this problem of chronic angina pectoris refractory to medical and interventional therapies is a very common and disabling medical condition and a major public health problem. It is common not only in patients who are not good candidates for revascularization, but also in patients following successful revascularization. Uh, and, and this uh, entity of persistent or recurrent angina is not so rare. After successful revascularization procedure, between 20 and 40% of the patient suffer from persistent angina during short and medium term follow-up. This is true even when PCI is optimized using physiology guided approaches uh, and drug routing stent. So I'm gonna start by presenting a patient that I'm taking care of for the last few years. This is Mr. RH who is 65 years old, very active gentleman. Uh, his past medical history show that he suffers from diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and obstructive coronary artery disease. Uh, in the year of 2011, he underwent cabbage surgery with Lima to LAD and a free Rima to D1 and M1 and a vein graft to the RPDA. Uh, in the last year, he started suffering from severe effort angina, CCS class 3, with shortness of breath, after 100 meters of walking on a flat level and after uh, climbing one flight of stairs despite optimal medical therapy. He had ev objective evidence of ischemia both by SPECT test and the butamine echo. Uh, his resting ejection fraction was good, e um, EF of 55. Uh, he could walk on a treadmill on Bruce protocol uh, stress test for three, a little bit more than three uh, minutes and his six minute walk, walk test, he could walk 368 uh, minutes. So because of the severe angina, I brought him to the cat lab and the coronary angiography showed uh, completely occluded uh, native circulation. The left main is occluded as you can see on the left, but the grafts were patent. The vein graft to the RPDA is open and the lima and rima are open but the distal vessels are very uh, narrow and diffusely diseased, and there are few marginal branches that do not uh, are not supplied by grafts. 
Therefore, I decided to implant a reducer in this patient. Uh, on the left side, you can see the inflation of the reducer with the uh, guiding shot of contrast just to demonstrate that I oversized sufficiently the reducer into the coronary sinus. And then the final shot after reducer was implanted, you see nice oversizing of both ends of the reducer with a narrowing at the center. And after six months after the reducer, the patient was completely asymptomatic. He had no angina anymore. He could walk daily for six and seven kilometers and he stopped using uh, nitro spray. And if we uh, compare the baseline to six month follow-up uh, features, we can see that his angina almost disappeared. Uh, and also uh, on uh, objective evidence, he had no ischemia and on the butamine stress test, his ejection fraction at peak stress improved, which was 55 at baseline, it's now 70% at follow-up and his exercise capacity improved dramatically, both by stress test and by six minutes walk. This is a reducer. The reducer, for those who, of you who don't recognize it yet, it's a stainless steel balloon expandable device. It sits on a balloon and you actually control the diameter of both ends of the device by the inflation pressure in the in deflator. The center is always three millimeters uh, unless you exceed six atmospheres of inflation. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes now uh, to show you the results of a very exciting uh, multi-center prospective trial that is going on in Europe right now. Um, this is a trial, a multi-center trial uh, that is going on in, in uh, up to 40 centers in Europe and is about to enroll a total of four, 400 patients. I'm going to show the interim analysis of the results of the first 222 uh, patients. Uh, the aim of the study is to confirm the improvement of patient symptoms, functional status, and quality of life. Patient with chronic effort angina, stable patient with preserved ejection fraction. And as I said, this is a multi-center international non-randomized open label uh, study uh, in many countries in Europe. Uh, and we have two arms. Arm one is the prospective enrolling and follow-up arm and arm two are prospective uh, patient with prospective follow-up on implantation that had been done in the past. Uh, here I will show the results of the prospective arm and the overall patient. A very sick group of patients. You can see that uh, more than 80% of the patient already had uh, bypass or PCI. 100% of the patient almost had both cabbage and PCI. And the results show uh, on, the, on the dark blue is patient who improved in one CCS grade and in light blue patient who improved two CCS grade. Improvement in two CCS grade is actually telling us that the patient with severe angina had become only mildly symptomatic or completely asymptomatic like the patient I presented at the beginning. And you can see that after six months, one year and two years, the results are the same that about 80% of the patient, between 70 and 80% of the patient improve one class and about 30% of the patient improve two class uh, CCS class of angina. And if we separate the results between the prospective arm only and the overall population, the results are exactly similar. And we see on the left of both uh, charts that uh, at the beginning, at baseline, most patients have class two, three, and four angina, and at follow-up, most patients have only class one and two angina, and it doesn't matter uh, in both arms. And I can tell you that the same results, actually, copy of the results are the results of the COSIRA trial, which was a randomized prospective sham control trial. So we see here uh, exactly the same results. If we look only at the very sick patient, a very disabled group of patient, patient with uh, CCS class three and four, which means patient with angina at every minimal effort and at rest, 70% uh, of the population of the reducer one had such severe angina, disabling angina at baseline. And then you can see follow up up to five years, 
the effectiveness is maintained for a very long follow-up. And if at the beginning, 70% of the cohort had CCS class three and four disabling angina, at follow-up, only between 15 and 18% of the patient still have CCS class three or four and we calculated the number needed to treat for that is, is very low, it's 1.5, which is really in, very impressive. Uh, how safe is the device? We, we knew that the device was safe from the COSERA trial and from other uh, non-randomized trial, but here we see really, and I circle it in, in, in a red circle, that we don't have actually any uh, device-related uh, adverse event in the reducer one uh, trial. Uh, what about quality of life, angina status and functional capacity? We can see here the results and also I here separate between the prospective arm one and the overall population. We see a very significant improvement in six minute walk test and in uh, exercise duration on treadmill stress test. Improvement uh, of both the overall population and the prospective arm. Regarding quality of life that was tested with the Seattle Angina questionnaire and the EQ 5D 5L score, uh, again, we show marked improvement in quality of life and angina status as assessed by those two uh, quality of life tests. Both of them were significantly improved uh, at uh, one year after reducer implantation. We also checked the number of emergency department visit in the year prior to the reducer implantation and the one year follow-up after reducer implantation. And we compare here baseline and one year follow-up and we see dramatic decrease in the number of uh, emergency visit due to angina. Um, and we see a, dr a dramatic uh, decrease of about 90% uh, uh, of these visits. So what am I telling you here is that uh, we know that the reducer is a novel technology designed to improve quality of life and functional capacity by reducing angina burden. Uh, we already have abundant clinical and preclinical data demonstrating the safety and the long-term efficacy of this therapy. Recent very exciting data suggests the effectiveness of the reducer also in patients with angina with non-obstructive coronary artery disease. It is still remain to be proven that the reducer is effective therapy for microvascular dysfunction, but as I told you, there are some very exciting data that we are going to hear in the next uh, few talks in this session about this group of patients and maybe the, the potential role of the reducer in this type of patients. Thank you very much. And from here, I would like to move to my dear friend Francesco Giannini, who has a lot of experience uh, treating patients with a reducer in both type of groups of patients that I have described. He published a lot of papers uh, about his uh, data and he's going to present a case of a patient and then show us uh, uh, maybe the largest cohort of patient population uh, that, is, uh, that he has under his care uh, with collaboration with other centers in Europe. Francesco, please go ahead. So first of all, uh, good morning everybody and many thanks to Professor Banai for uh, uh, his kind introduction. Uh, so my clinical case uh, is about a 65 years old lady with diabetes mellitus on oral antidiabetic medications and uh, arterial hypertension well controlled uh, with uh, uh, several drugs. Uh, she has a long clinical history of chronic refractory angina, uh, despite treatment with beta blocker, ivabradine, and calcium antagonists. And uh, she does not tolerate ranolazine and long acting nitrates because of uh, dyspnea and headache, respectively. In September 2015, uh, she underwent a coronary angiography showing uh, no epicardial coronary artery disease, and she was discharged on medical therapy. A uh, few years later, uh, she was referred to our hospital uh, 
due to a worsening of angina symptoms, currently Canadian class uh, uh, three, Canadian class score three. And we decided to perform an exercise tolerance test. Uh, it was positive for both angina symptoms and uh, diffuse ST depression at ACG, as you can see. Accordingly, uh, we decided to repeat the coronary angiography in a patient with the typical uh, uh, angina symptoms and the clear evidence of myocardial ischemia. Uh, here you see the angiogram. It revealed uh, a, a focal uh, and mild stenosis uh, in the mid left anterior descending artery. Uh, you can appreciate it. Uh, in this case, uh, in such a patient with diabetes mellitus, we frequently consider uh, intravascular ultrasound. Uh, to exclude uh, diffuse disease that can be cause of uh, underestimation of epicardial coronary artery disease. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, distally and proximally to the lesion, there was not uh, uh, diffuse coronary artery disease. Uh, you see here the frame at the uh, lesion level, uh, there is a stable uh, uh, plaque, a quite calcific plaque, uh, but the um, residual lumen is pre uh, preserved. Uh, you see a minimal lumen area of seven millimeters square, so it was confirmed that the uh, stenosis was not significant. So we decided to uh, functionally uh, evaluate the uh, stenosis. We perform an adenosine fractional flow reserve. Uh, it was negative with the FFR uh, of uh, 0.89 across the middle AD and with the distal, uh, uh, the pressure wire uh, uh, distal into the vessel. And uh, we decided to uh, perform an acetylcholine test uh, that was negative, so excluding uh, the vasospasm as a cause of the angina symptoms of the patient. So there was a very high suspect of microvascular disease. Uh, then we uh, perform the perfusion cardiac magnetic resonance uh, with uh, dipyridamol as a stressor and with uh, the administration of gadolinium. Uh, there was not uh, hypoperfusion defect uh, at the qualitative assessment, but we saw a diffuse impairment of the myocardial perfusion reserve index involving uh, almost uh, all the myocardial segments. Uh, the mean value was 1.25, so uh, it was really a case of uh, uh, severe and diffuse uh, microvascular dysfunction. Uh, so uh, we have a patient with uh, absence of a significant epicardial coronary artery disease. We have a clear evidence of diffuse myocardial ischemia uh, with an accurate test uh, as uh, uh, is the uh, perfusion cardiac magnetic resonance in a patient with angina that is refractory uh, to maximally tolerated medical therapy. Uh, so we had a clear diagnosis of microvascular uh, angina and uh, there is no room to uh, improve uh, anti-anginal uh, treatment just because the patient does not tolerate uh, ranolazine and nitrates. So uh, we discussed in our team this patient, we have some experience with the reducer therapy in patients uh, without significant coronary artery disease. Uh, this is a case series published a few years ago, including eight patients uh, uh, with uh, uh, some stenosis uh, at the coronary artery, but not significant at the functional evaluation. And after reducer treatment, uh, uh, we observe the significant improvement of angina symptoms, as, um, quality of life as detected by Seattle Angina Questionnaire, and an improvement of uh, myocardial ischemia is detected by the cardiac magnetic resonance. So for this patient, we decided to move on with a coronary sinus reducer implantation. Uh, the procedure was uh, uh, quite straightforward without uh, any complication. And at four months of follow up, we observed the regression of angina symptoms to Canadian class score uh, class one from Canadian class score three at the baseline. At the cardiac magnetic resonance analysis, uh, we observed the significant improvement of the myocardial perfusion reverse index in most of the myocardial segments. At 12 months follow-up, the improvement of angina symptoms uh, was maintained, uh, still in Canadian class uh, one, and there was also a significant improvement uh, of quality of life as detected by the Seattle angina questionnaire. 
I want to just to spend a, a few minutes of my presentation uh, showing uh, the results of the resource study. Uh, it is an observational uh, multicenter registry focusing on uh, reducer efficacy and safety. It includes uh, 21 centers from Europe, United Kingdom and Israel, counting uh, over 650 patients with the refractory angina despite optimal medical therapy, all patients with the objective evidence of myocardial ischemia and no option for coronary vascularization. The median follow-up of uh, um, the study is 500 days. So uh, if we see the clinical characteristic of the patient, we can appreciate as uh, uh, it is a, a population with an average age of 70 years. Um, the males are prevalent, uh, almost 80%. There is a very high prevalence of diabetes mellitus, almost 50%. And uh, in 95% of the patients, there was a clinical history of previous uh, CAPE or previous uh, uh, PCI. On the right, you see uh, these are uh, evilly symptomatic patients. Uh, they are uh, in uh, Canadian class score uh, 3 4 in 90% of the cases. Uh, these are the data about the procedural safety. So, the procedural success uh, was reached in uh, almost 98% of the patients. There were a few cases of uh, aborted procedures, mainly related to the tortuosity of the coronary sinus. Uh, we didn't observe any case of periprocedural death, any case of conversion to open surgery, and uh, uh, there was uh, a six, almost 6% six rate of periprocedural complication, uh, mainly driven by device symbolization, 15 cases. Uh, in uh, almost all the cases, it was possible to percutaneously retrieve the embolized device, with the exception of one case in which the device was left uh, in the pulmonary artery uh, branch. Uh, we see some case uh, of uh, coronary sinus uh, death section that we saw uh, needs a, a conservative approach, uh, some uh, access site complication, and uh, uh, very few cases of coronary perforation uh, without needing a conversion to upper surgery. All the perforation were managed uh, simply with a uh, reverse uh, uh, of the heparin with the protamine administration then solving the problem. And we saw some cases of coronary sinus dislodgement from the delivery catheter and one case of stroke that was related to a puncture uh, in the carotid artery uh, site. Uh, what about the efficacy outcomes? Uh, uh, we saw a significant improvement of angina symptoms. So. Uh, from 90% of patients uh, in uh, Canadian class score 3 or 4 at the baseline, uh, we observed that at the last available follow-up, uh, less than 25% in Canadian class score 3 or 4. And on the right, you see that uh, uh, the benefit uh, in terms of angina symptoms improvement is uh, independent on the uh, duration of the follow-up. And this is just... Uh, a uh, Kaplan-Meier curve uh, showing and confirming as uh, uh, these patients uh, uh, do not have uh, a poor outcome uh, at almost four years follow-up. Uh, we have still a survival that is higher than 85% and it seems that uh, in patients uh, um, in which we had uh, uh, an improvement of at least one Canadian class score, uh, um, we have uh, a trend uh, in a reduction of survival. So, uh, in conclusion, coronary sinus reducer may have a role in the management of patients uh, with refractory angina, even if uh, these patients uh, do not have uh, significant coronary artery disease. But what is important is uh, uh, to uh, demonstrate the objective myocardial ischemia. Uh, we have uh, uh, important uh, uh, inside from the resource registry that is the largest real world experience on coronary sinus reducer. Uh, the registry confirms that the reducer implant is uh, safe with a reported rate of complication around uh, 5% uh, and efficacy improvement angina symptoms uh, of note 75% uh, of the patient experience uh, a reduction of at least 
one Canadian class score class. So uh, many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Francesco. This was fantastic. I have one question I wanted to refer to you and to Tommaso. Your patient, until not recently, has uh, uh, in, in most of the cat lab would be sent home and uh, we would say to that uh, kind of patient, you have a false positive stress test, you have non-obstructive coronary artery disease, you can go home and just discharge a patient. I think there is no such thing as a false positive stress test. All these patients might have a disease that we ignored until now, and now maybe we can treat. What do you think? And then I'll ask the same question, Tommaso, too. What do you think, Francesco? I completely agree with you. In our clinical practice, we frequently face with uh, such a patients with uh, a positive ischemia test, no evidence of epicardial coronary artery disease, uh, we should not stop here our uh, uh, diagnostic process, but uh, we should investigate uh, deeply, try to understand which is the reason of uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, I think uh, in any cat lab should be uh, available uh, the acetylcholine to do a test and to exclude in this patient the vasospasm as cause of the symptoms. And it is crucial uh, if the uh, acetylcholine test is negative uh, to investigate more uh, uh, by evaluating the IMR invasively or not invasively, for example, by using the cardiac magnetic resonance uh, to detect, uh, to detect uh, microvascular dysfunction. And then in this patient, we have uh, definitely to consider coronary sinus reducer as treatment. Tommaso, what do you think? What do you do with such patients? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with uh, with what has been said, and I would like to add something in another direction. Actually, if the if there is one thing that the Orbita and the Ischemia Trial have taught us is that so we have to believe the symptoms of the patient, and this is what we can improve. So not only uh, there is more to coronary physiology than just epicardial diseases that may explain a positive explain a positive uh, stress test. There is also a number of patients with uh, uh, a negative stress echo or a negative stress scintigraphy who actually do have microvascular disease. And the reason for the negative test is that there is no region, regional wall motion abnormality. The dysfunction is so diffuse across the myocardium that you're not able to see on those imaging tests uh, focal disease. But those patients have angina and deserve treatment and attention, of course. I'm honored to welcome Dr. Colin Berry from the University of Glasgow. Colin is the PI of the Cormica study that has shaped recent ESC guidelines and demonstrated that the patient-centered treatment strategy makes a difference for patients suffering from angina with no obstructive coronary artery disease. Colin, thank you very much for sh uh, sharing your thoughts with us on angina with non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Please, Colin. Thank you for that introduction. Microvascular angina. These are my institutional disclosures. I hold no personal contracts. So in the coming minutes, uh, I would like to share with you the definition of microvascular angina, prevalence, prognosis, contemporary guidelines, and if time, considerations for future research. So the prevalence of this problem, and indeed what is or what might be microvascular angina. So chest pain is an endemic problem in our society, presents a substantial burden on healthcare, both in the primary and secondary care sectors. In the United Kingdom, their overall expenditure and coronary heart disease approximates one billion pounds, and there are approximately one million attendances at chest pain clinics in the National Health Service. And clearly, this experience is replicated in many countries around the world. Increasingly, the diagnostic test, the preferred diagnostic test, is CT coronary angiography, in other words, anatomical imaging. And the purpose of that test in a patient with chest pain is to determine whether there is obstructive coronary artery disease. 
In this slide, you can see a stenosis in the right coronary artery. Turns out that that problem affects about one in five or fewer of those patients presenting in unselected care. Of course, this, this patient can then be amenable to treatment with a stent or if there are multiple narrowings, coronary artery bypass surgery. However, that means that the large majority of patients undergo tests but do not have this problem, potentially leaving the cause of their chest symptoms unexplained. Recent research involving measurements of small vessel function in the heart to assess for microvascular angina or vasospastic angina identifies approximately two in five patients may well be affected, that being at least double the prevalence of obstructive coronary disease. We also know that the health burden in these patients is substantial, that they attend hospital mul multiply in primary and secondary care, and that there is an appreciable adverse prognostic risk. Making a diagnosis uh, in the catheter laboratory of small vessel disease can be challenging when testing is based on anatomical imaging by angiography alone. Pleasingly, technological developments now enable specific measurements of microvascular function, such as by using a diagnostic guide wire and coronary thermal dilution techniques. Coming to the diagnosis of microvascular angina, well, this is one endotype, in other words, a disease subgroup within a number of different clinical scenarios that clinicians will face in daily practice. If we use a diagnostic guide wire that permits measurement of fractional flow reserve, along with the index of microvascular resistance, whereby a threshold of 25 or higher is taken to be abnormal, or impaired coronary flow reserve, whereby a threshold of 2.5 or certainly 2 or lower is also taken to be abnormal. So using an ischemic threshold with FFR of 0.8 or with a resting index of 0.89, we can segment out disease uh, and classify it in order to identify endotypes. So in the upper left panel, we have obstructive coronary disease, which of course will be visually, visually apparent by angiography, but also microvascular disease because of IMR being raised and CFR being impaired. And in item two, in the upper right quadrant, you'll see focal coronary disease with preserved microvascular function. In the lower left quadrant, you'll see isolated microvascular disease, where IMR is high, CFR is low, but FFR is normal. Or a combination of pathophysiologies of atherosclerosis without obstructive uh, consequences and microvascular dysfunction. We were concerned about the heterogeneous aspects of clinical care and the possibility that patients are being systematically underdiagnosed and therefore suboptimally managed. Uh, we invoked uh, an all-comers approach to testing in the ca cardiac catheter laboratory in the Golden Jubilee National Hospital in the west of Scotland. During a 12-month period in the Carmica clinical trial, we enrolled 391 near consecutive patients, invited them uh, to participate in this study before having the angiogram. Turned out that half of these patients had no obstructive coronary disease, so 151, allowing for approximately 40 patients who were ineligible to proceed because of logistical reasons. So 151 patients with angina but no obstructive coronary disease were then randomized to a test strategy using the diagnostic guide wire and also acetylcholine testing with the results disclosed in half whereby measurements were obtained in the control group but not disclosed. We then employed a management strategy whereby patients endotyped with microvascular angina such as because of a high IMR, a low CFR, or a microvascular dysfunction on reactivity testing, 
would then have treatment specified according to that endotype. So for example, with impaired vasodilator reserve or a constrictive physiology, a calcium channel blocker might be prescribed. And of course, lifestyle interventions. We observed during six and 12 months follow-up that the angina score improved and quality of life and symptoms generally improved also as compared to angiography guided standard care. But what are the prognostic implications of this diagnosis? Well, recent, uh, recent information has, um, has emerged from uh, Godowski and Brown in the United States. They undertook a systematic review of isolated coronary microvascular dysfunction involving several studies with outcome measures, including mortality and MACE. They observed that uh, from, four, from three studies, that microvascular dysfunction was associated with a near fourfold increase in mortality and a fivefold increase in the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. The Practice Guideline Committee of the European Society of Cardiology has presented a new guideline, so-called cr chronic coronary syndromes, and they have identified angina in patients with no obstructive coronary disease as being an important clinical problem and also benefiting from recent evidence. Accordingly, they have de designated new, new practice guideline <coughs> recommendations for the diagnosis of microvascular angina. There is now a 2A level of evidence B guideline recommendation for the use of guide wire testing in patients with pers persistent symptoms but angiographically unobstructed coronary arteries. There is a 2B guideline recommendation for the use of intracoronary acetylcholine testing and also 2B guideline recommendation for non-invasive testing for myocardial ischemia. These guidelines now empower clinicians to use such tests during daily pr practice in the catheter laboratory. So to conclude, micro microvascular angina is common. It affects approximately one in three patients in unselected clinical care and is potentially even more common if considering a, a selected approach. Overall, microvascular and vasospastic angina are under-recognized, under-treated, and prognosis is poor. The Carmica trial was the first to implement stratified medicine in the cardiac catheter laboratory, that is, to, to use specific tests to identify disease endotypes, such as microvascular angina, in whom a specific therapy in this case has been demonstrated to improve angina and quality of life. There are now practice guideline recommendations from the European Society of Cardiology to support this strategy and disease modifying therapy remains an unmet therapeutic need and a research priority going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much Colin. Uh, this is fantastic presentation. In your practice, uh, according to what you know, in this patient who present with angina and you test them in the cat lab and you diagnose them as having a microvascular angina, microvascular disease, and you treat them uh, uh, according to uh, what you suggest, um, how many of them, after optimized treatment, personalized treatment, how many of them remain symptomatic and continue to suffer from angina? And what do you do with these patients? Thank you for that question. So the magnitude of the treatment effect in Carmica was an improvement in the Seattle angina score of 10 points. And that averaged uh, benefit equates to the effect of a single angina drug. Um, more specifically to your question, it is the case that many of these patients continue to have symptoms. I think probably 
at least half. Um, so the test strategy personalizing um, care leads to improvements overall, perhaps substantially in individual patients, but most patients will continue to experience symptoms. And that's why I believe more research is needed to develop uh, specific disease modifying therapies. And of course, there is a place for uh, mechanical device placed therapies also. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Colin. Uh, however, we remain with a question mark. Do we have a treatment for this very large cohort of patients? And uh, recently there are some very, as I told you at the beginning, very exciting data coming out from few centers, very few centers, unfortunately, around the world. And, and one of these uh, one of these centers are uh, which are producing very exciting data and potential showing potential therapy for these patients uh, with a very high promise is from uh, University of Mainz in Germany and uh, uh, it is my pleasure to ask Dr. Tommaso Gori to show us um, what is the promise. Please Tommaso. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Banai. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nervas, for uh, inviting me and, and allowing me to be here. Uh, the field is extremely interesting and the disease is a black box. Uh, we don't have an, uh, an accurate way of standardizing the uh, diagnostic of those patients. We don't have an accurate way of standardizing the therapy of those patients. But as you said before, there is going to be uh, something under development and I hope that it will be successful in the future. So let me just present this case. Uh, this is a male of 61 years old. Mm, he had an intervention in 2017. Uh, he received a drug routine stent of an intermediate RCA stenosis. And I would like to point out here that the patient had angina and he was treated for an intermediate RCA stenosis, probably inappropriately. This patient had arterial hypertension. He had diabetes, he had hypertriglyceridemia, and after this treatment of the, uh, of the RCA, he still had angina, expectedly. He came back for an angiogram with unstable angina in September 2017. He went back to our hospital in uh, December 2017 with unstable angina, and we didn't perform uh, angiography at that time because there was a negative angiogram three months before. He, went, he came back again a year later in September 2018, again classified as unstable angina, and he showed again no lesion visible at angiography. Unfortunately, he went to another hospital a month later and he underwent again angiography uh, for the same symptoms and with the same results. Then had a period of no symptoms, and a month later went yet to another hospital and underwent again angiography with symptoms of unstable angina and no evidence of uh, lesions. Interestingly, this patient was able to go on a skiing holiday without symptoms, but then on alternate days and some days without exercise, he had CCS class three or four angina. And this is the typical presentation of patients with uh, microvascular uh, disease. Um, now, uh, in December 2019, he underwent again angiography in our center, and this is just to show that there was really no uh, epicardial lesion, but what we did was a full uh, study of the coronary circulation. Um, and this is the uh, uh, printout of the, uh, of the software that does the analysis. Now, um, up in uh, yellow, you will see the FFR, which everybody knows, this is the pressure gradient across the stenosis when there is a stenosis and the value of 0.87 confirms that there was no significant epicardial stenosis. Um, and then on the left side of this uh, black screen, you see a TMM um, of 2.04. And this is a pathological value. The TMM is the time it takes a bolus of saline, which we inject through the coronary uh, catheter, uh, to go from the shaft of the catheter, so from the minute it touches the, the second it touches the, the wire, to a pressure thermistor, uh, sorry, to a, a thermistor that is placed at the same place where the, uh, where the pressure sensor is in the wire. 
So the longer this time, the lower is the blood flow. So TMN is inverse to the, to the blood flow. Now, the inverse of a, of a blood flow times the pressure makes an index of microvascular resistances. And this is what this IMR is. It, it's in orange at the right side of the, of the slide. An IMR is pathological above 25 and is associated with uh, uh, poor prognosis for the patient. And this patient has had the highest IMR which I've ever seen. His IMR was 63, which is extremely pathological, almost three times the upper uh, normal level, which is already associated with a poor prognosis. Uh, so the patient had a clear diagnosis of uh, uh, microvascular angina. Not knowing what the best therapy for those patients is and having exhausted all me medical therapies, the patient was already on ranolazine and uh, uh, nitrates, which is not really the best therapy for microvascular angina. We implanted a sinus reducer. And I would like to point out that we implanted the sinus reducer, maybe you see it on the left uh, uh, figure or film. We implanted the sinus reducer at the level of a um, valve of venous uh, valve, causing a gradient already at the time of the implantation. Then we measured IMR and all uh, um, physiological parameters after the uh, um, implantation of the coronary sinus reducer. And what we saw was particularly interesting is that the IMR went down from 63, very pathological, to 37, still pathological, but was almost half as high as it was before. Now, this is from very pathological to much better. I have a similar patient who had uh, epicardial stenosis. He had three vessel disease. He had a CTO of the right coronary artery, no vitality inferolateral, so no reason to do a, a complex uh, procedure of the right coronary artery. He had a pathological FFR without focal stenosis of the LAD. So this patient really is a, an epicardial um, disease patient, no suspect of microvascular disease in this patient. Still, a sinus reducer is indicated to treat this patient. And we perform IMR measurements before and after the reducer in this patient without microvascular disease, just to see what happens in, those, in this type of, uh, of patients. We perform the, uh, the IMR measurements uh, with the reducer balloon still in the, uh, in the reducer directly after the implantation, simulating the effect of the reducer upon long, long time implantation. And what we saw was even in this patient who had a normal IMR at baseline was a 25% decrease after uh, sinus reducer implantation. So this is amazing, um, an amazing observation that shows how increasing the pressure in the coronary venous system actually decreases the uh, microvascular resistances in the coronary system. Now, this is all a little bit complicated, and I'm not sure that I have the uh, answer for explaining this uh, phenomenon, but I've prepared some, uh, a couple of slides to try and say what my hypothesis uh, is. This is the normal circulation to the uh, up uh, uh, right corner. I, I made this, this graph, so excuse the, the poor graphical quality. Um, on the y-axis is flow, on the x-axis is pressure. This is the normal autoregulation curve. This is the relationship between uh, flow and pressure under vasodilation. The relationship is linear. So the flow increases linearly with uh, blood pressure. This is the classical experiments of uh, um, Gould. With sinus reducer, I would expect this uh, curve or this line to move to the right because the blood pressure in the venous system is higher. So I need a larger pressure to obtain the same uh, blood flow. Actually, what I see in the, at least in the, in the patients that I, that I measured before and uh, after sinus reducer implantation is a left shift of this curve. So I have a better flow, lower resistances for the same uh, blood uh, pressure. Now, the reason for this is complicated. I'm not sure that I have uh, the final answer, but I believe that the increase in pressure, in venous pressure proximal to the coronary sinus reduces increases the standing, the standing pressures in the microvasculature, 
which causes a paradoxical decrease in microvascular resistances, particularly at the level of the um, subendocardium, which is the more ischemic region in these uh, in these patients, as we as we all know. So this is worth a study, and we are doing the study in form of two randomized controlled trials and one uh, registry. Um, the, uh, the registry investigates the different phenotypes of uh, um, coronary physiology, um, mixes of epicardial and microvascular uh, disease. The randomized controlled trial, which we called COSIMA in analogy with the COSIRA, COSIRA study of the sinus reducer, we randomized patients with microvascular disease to receive the reducer or optical medical therapy. And the end point of this study is same as uh, with COSARA, an improvement in uh, CCS class. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, present this data uh, sometime in the next uh, years. And for the moment, I thank you for your attention and for your uh, questions that may come. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Francesco, Tommaso and Colin. I think it was exciting and fascinating since we maybe have a light at the end of the channel and maybe a lo very large group of patients that we have ignored until now and told them that we don't have an option for treatment or maybe they don't need a treatment. Now maybe we understand more the physiology and maybe we can treat this patient. And it is amazing to see that something that have started in 1945 by a cardiac surgeon who didn't under really understand what he's doing by narrowing the coronary sinus, but proved that it is very effective. And he thought that the result is angiogenesis. Now with the technology, and scientists like you and clinicians like you, we understand better the physiology and we can explain why narrowing of the coronary sinus can improve angina, improve symptoms and probably improve microvascular dysfunction. Thank you very much. It was very exciting and I thank you all.